2,508. I'm your Joe Dex, Joe Ben Mark Augustiniak. Hey, hey. Matt Sellner. Hello. The Free Cheese is a weekly video game podcast about video games brought to you once a week by thefreecheese.com. This week, the month of June has begun, season 11 continues, and we're talking game dev story. More on that in a bit. First, I want to know, Matt, what did you name your fictional video game company here in Game Dev Story? Um, from Soft, but from with a U. <laughs> Perfect. And Soft with a U. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mark, what did you uh, apply? This is probably one of the your... hardest parts of the game for me. Um, <laughs> I knew it would be. Um, but so because it was so hard, I just decided to be like, I turned my brain off and I just went with Mirage Games. Ah, uh, that's a cute name. That's fitting for you. Because oh. uh, for those who don't know, Mirage Comics was the original company that did the Ninja Turtle comics and has now dissolved since, since Nickelodeon now owns Ninja Turtles. Um, so I figured let that name live on through this. That's a good one. Uh, I went with Quando games uh, because mm. around the house we just say Quando whenever we're trying to get the dog's attention. I scream Quando. So while trying to come up with a name, we had just said Quando, and thus that became my. So let's talk game dev story. The developer on this one is Kairosoft, and the publisher on this one, Kairosoft. First released, this one's a little tricky, first released uh, in Japan for the personal computer in 1997, but depending on which source you seek, it could be April 1997, it could be specifically October 9th, 1997, and in other fashions it could be 1996, ambiguously. So I'm not quite sure when this game came out. But I can tell you that in 2010, it made its American debut on both iOS and Android. It would later be released on Switch, the PlayStation 4, and Steam. The back of the box, or in this case, the Steam description. Bro, you forgot the Windows phone. Just gonna throw that out there. I kind of went into platforms that were relevant. But yes, Matt, thank you. It did release on Windows Phone in 2015, according to wikipedia.com. Org, whatever they, yes. Ever wondered what it would be like to own your own game company, make your own games? Game Dev Story answers that question by putting up, putting a new up-and-coming game development studio in your hands. As the CEO, you choose your game style, address the market with the right kind of content on the right platform, and make your mark in the games industry. Game Dev Story is a simulation game, with the main aim being to take a small development studio and build it up to become the largest game developer on the planet. You'll have full control over all everyday activities as a, st- a studio entails, such as the hire and fire of staff, what games to develop and for which consoles, whether to attend certain media events, and the occasional chance to purchase improvements to your studio, such as moving to a larger building. Finances are based on overall product sales, determined largely by the audience you're able to rake in, get it right, and you'll be able to develop sequels to your most successful games or hire out big names to help create your next one. All the while, you will also have to balance the books or advertise your company and your games through various ways. So I added this game to Season 11's list of games to play. Um, I... (laughs) I will tell you, I had a, I think every game on the list that we've done this year that I chose, I mean, they all have their own reasons and whatnot. This one, I remember I hit a point where I was trying to be very diligent about picking games, uh, not repeating platforms. So every game I chose for this list, I got to double check if I actually stuck to it or not, but I tried to not have two games from the same platform. And I hit a point where I was like, boy, I don't have any mobile titles. Should I? Does that even matter? Do I even play mobile games? And I started to run through games that I did play on a mobile platform. And this one stood out as one because it was like... Maybe not the first, eh, but one of the early examples of a game I remember playing on my phone and like 
actually getting lost in playing. Uh, and I have a specific story about when I first played it, but uh, yeah. So I, I just remember like this being a standout, like, oh, games on phones can be good. Um, not that they weren't before, but they were different, right? Like they were not these kind of full-fledged simulation experiences. Now, little did I know at the time, this was a port of a full-fledged PC sim game. Um, but I just thought it was neat. And I thought the like practice of trying to pick a console and license its, um, or, you know, negotiate the license to develop for the console, you know, like you had to really pick with which platform you were going after and what types of games you were making. And then the fact that all these fake consoles in the game mirrored real world consoles, like you kind of, you felt like you got to develop for the Game Boy or the Genesis or the whatever. And that was kind of neat to me. Um, yeah, that was my main impetus for adding the game. Uh, but Mark, have you played this one before now? Uh, no, this was my first time. Um, I wanted it to play on Steam, but it failed launching. It said it couldn't launch Dungeon Village 2. That was the error that I got. Code 86 to be specific. Um, Great. So I refunded it. Yep. And then <laughs> played it on my phone. <laughs> I'm wondering if that was the name of a fake game inside of the game or if I don't it's know. Microsoft. Like I tried like verifying the integrity of the files. I reinstalled it. If it's just for some reason, it just would not boot up. That sucks. Do you have your uh, Visual C++ installed in the right disk drive? I've gone down that road recently for games on this list. I mean, I hope so. You should. Everything else has been okay. Do you have a dual? <laughs> do you have a double drive? A double drive? Sorry, do you have two different disk drives? Uh, turn no. it into troubleshoot Mark's computer. Okay, then never mind. You will not have it the same problem. Okay, Just a carry C on. Drive. <laughs> uh, Matt, you you have played this before, yes? Yes. Yeah, it's actually probably back in 2010 as well. Uh, would this have been on phone for you? Windows phone or what was No, your... <laughs> it wasn't hip enough for a Windows phone. No, it would have been on, um, on iOS. Oh, maybe. All right, sorry. I don't know if I have an iPhone at this point. It's probably not too long after I get my first iPhone, which is an iPhone 4 yeah. on Verizon. So whenever you want to line up that release first, when I finally right. get, an, you know, an iPhone and, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't remember when I first played it, but I remember the time I spent the most with it prior to this session. And it was, I was delivering pizzas and it was a Sunday night and my shift on Sundays used to be like five to midnight and I got to work. It was like a summer or whatever. Um, I got to work and the power had been out all day and it w had no sign of coming back on. But we couldn't go home because theoretically someone was coming to fix it. So we needed to wait for that to happen. And I'll say that I know it's a pizza shop and you might have uh, whatever assumptions about, you know, working there and, and whatever. But we really did work and we did make sure uh, the, the management was very adamant about like really not screwing around. So while all of us loved video games and I remember like. When Pokemon came out, we were all like avidly, uh, we'd come in before our shift and we'd trade Pokemon or battle or something with our 3DSs and stuff like that. There really was no time for screwing around, whether it was late night or any time else. But I remember this was the one exception where it was like, well, I can't send you guys home, but there's literally no work for you to do. So just hang out. And I sat there and I played this on my phone and I came up with game after game and I worked my way all the way through the different console generations. And then at some point, most of the people got sent home because it was like almost eight o'clock or something. Uh, right. And then the power came on and I got to close out the shift, uh, knowing that I'd not only made some money that night, but I also uh, raked in a lot of uh, valuable video game projects. <laughs> there you go. But that always stood out to me. Like, it was just, like, a solid, like, I had a good time. And then from then on, like, I would just kind of pop into the game and just see what I could, you know, 
get done in an afternoon? How many things I could rack up? How far could I take a company? Or would I completely destroy it? Or what game ideas would come to me? Which combinations would work well? Um, Because as you play the game, you you start out and really you can only develop games for the PC, uh, just with your budget and what resources are available to you. And um, you're given the option to choose between a game type and a genre. So you can then like, Combine them. Maybe you want an action game that has a ninja theme. Uh, Maybe you want a dungeon crawler that is history themed. Don't know why you would do that, but you could do that. Uh, And you start to get into all of these different combinations of things. And then as time progresses, because there's like a real in-game timer, new consoles get announced and released. And you can start to purchase the licenses to develop for those consoles. Um, Or maybe you can. I want to get into that because, boy, did I have a tough time affording the licensing fees. Uh, And then, yeah, you can you can do that and start to you grow an audience. People become fans of your games. Uh, At the time you release all of your games, you get reviews in magazines. Um, And there's a lot of really good, I think, like in world writing and stuff that kind of pulls in from our reality uh some of the magazine reviews and the reviewers are very much like if you read a lot of egm then you'll recognize some of the tropes and stuff as they pop up uh some of the figures that appear as staff you can hire uh it's like shigentu minamoto like it's stuff (laughs) is like so close to the actual person's name that it's not um but yeah, so I guess Matt, what was your first time playing it, or, or did uh, your time with it now hold up to when you first played it? No, my uh, the, the t- playing through it religiously now, because like you, I've kind of poked at it from time to time, uh, not for terribly long, but um, no, I mean this this was good this time around. I remember being very good my first time around. And I don't have a lot of memories from, like, what I specifically made. The only thing I remember was I was struggling for, like, that first hit game. Because you kind of get to that point where you got the staff to finally make uh, a a Hall of Fame game. Uh, I put that in quotes because you have to get a score of 32 or above when it comes to reviews to become a Hall of Fame. And I was trying to get that first Hall of Fame game so that way I could make a sequel. And I was just throwing shit. You know, I was I was trying for anything. So I decided to do a visual novel and pair it with romance. And I named it for the very popular hit book and movie franchise at the time, Twilight. And that became uh, my fucking uh, go-to uh, moneymaker for when uh, my company needed fucking uh, a hit. So yeah, uh, we had I, uh, I made a hit very <laughs> a hit series of Twilight visual novel games that I thus you know that I per- made sure I'd stay with the uh, sequel na- naming. So we got Twilight, then we got New Moon, we got Eclipse. I made sure to do both parts of Breaking Dawn. Uh, I made sure we went mobile with it. Uh, make sure you know, make make sure it got into all hands possible. So, I just remember that was like the the bread and butter dude. of my first playthrough for whatever dumb reason. That is not too far from real life, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> Twilight is the reason why Comic Con is what it is. So many people elaborate. So when Comic Con used to be really small and um. Yeah. It got the there were there were people camping outside of the convention waiting for that panel to see those actors, and oh. because of that, everyone every other movie or thing swarmed to that convention, and it just be, it blew up for for what it was. I'm pretty sure it was Twilight. If not, then I might be confused with Harry Potter. But I think They're I'm almost the certain, time. almost for certain, it was Twilight that blew up Comic Con. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's, yeah. I think you could probably attribute it to some other factors, like, you know, FOMO becoming a thing and social media. Like, there's a lot of things that probably fed all at once, but yeah, that's that's the uh, the France Ferdinand, if you will. Yeah. Um, But yeah, no, besides that, I, I know I liked the game a lot because I ended up playing some of the other Kyrosoft games 
Mm, and yeah. I remember specifically. Did you play Dungeon uh, Village? I, I don't know. This started to birth. <laughs> What's you say? Did you play Dungeon Village Two? Was was that one of their games? No, I'm not seeing on our <laughs> list of mobile releases here. But um, like I, I think I played a couple of them before I got burnt out. It's kind of the same formula in all of them, just different theme. But I, um, I remember playing Grand Prix Story, and I don't know that started birthing something that oh, will yeah, turn that into have. yeah. So um, and I remember I think Grand Prix Story was a like brand new when i i got that so i guess i got my iphone like end of may june 2011 Hmm. um one thing that stood out uh this time is that i I did not have i never had a good there's an optimal way to play this game and there's ways you should play this game and once you know kind of which combinations of things work well together uh you can probably play this game pretty well i never got good at paying attention i did in the end because i kept getting burned but i never got good at paying attention to when uh game decks was coming up which is this game's version of e3 um Mm. i I believe it's month four of every year but i would hit a point when game decks would come up and i had just blown all of my cash on hand at something Mm. and you need a significant amount of cash on hand to actually attend the show. So there were a couple years in a row where like, I really needed the, to get to the show and have people see the game that we were working on. Um, That's rough. Cause like, and you, I blew it all on like letting someone who wanted to increase the game's graphics and then failed anyway, just added a bunch of bugs to the game. But I, I do love the game for that. Like there's these things that definitely happen in real world game development that, um, you get to kind of play out here with like sure let's invent let's in, let's invest a bunch of resources into trying to make the graphics better or make the sound better and then oh it didn't work and now the game's way broken and it's going to add a lot to debugging in the end um that's a real thing uh i mean how many times is like an outside director or artist brought into a game and they absolutely add fucking nothing to it and they're highly regarded <laughs> <laughs> I, you'd run into that in this game a lot but also the other thing that i'd run into was people who i'd trained up and like invested time and money into who you would Shit ask the them, like you know you get to the every time you start a new game project for the listeners who've not played you are asked okay we're going to start the game who would you like to write the scenario and you have a couple of people on staff and you, usually this goes with the different periods of development in a game you have people on staff who have different skill sets and job traits about them. And everyone's weighted with numbers in terms of their like ability. So if you are going to, you want someone who's a strong writer to work on the scenario. You want someone who's a strong artist to work on the graphics, et cetera. Um, But it's the worst when you say, Oh yeah, let's have uh, John work on the scenario. And then he comes back and he's just like, I think that was good enough. And you're like, no, it wasn't good enough. What do you mean? I just gave you all this money and training and you just did nothing. Uh, alas, I didn't fire anybody. I probably should have fired, but there were people, I was mm. like, maybe they'll do better next time. But I never had money to hire anybody either. So uh, it was always tough. To- yeah. Us at FromSoft, we were very, very strict. <laughs> Oh, you were cutting heads. You ever fuck cut? You gotta get your shit together. I was I... head hunting. I was, uh, I was, I was going to Hollywood agents <laughs> to bring people in. I needed, I need a quality. I was building up to make the game of games called Dark Souls, and I was waiting until I had the fucking staff to pull it off, and I felt like I never had it. Ah. Uh, but we, uh, I'm sure we'll talk more about our arcs but my company shifted hard (laughs) real hard in the last uh fifth of its of its uh i'm okay yeah (laughs) i want to hear your your game project trajectories uh mark how did you do with staffing i'll say uh they started me with with these two dudes and i ended up firing up firing both of them um one well because i just I, i i i'm still trying to figure the game out still trying to learn like 
its animation styles and if they mean anything because it's a simulation. So I didn't know how much emotions were involved in this game. But the one guy just always looked pissed off. And I was like, you're not bringing this into my environment, buddy. Billy Jates, you can get the fuck out. So, <laughs> like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I got I got rid of him. And then I had um, I ended up having uh, three women on board. And one of them kept approaching me to, like, take risks to, like, you know, enhance one of the things. And she she failed every time. Her track record was horrible. I was like, I'm not giving you any more chances. Yeah, no. I kept her on, but I was like, you're not taking these risks anymore. I would I, I'd give the risk to someone else until they messed up. And then it got to a point where I was trying to, like, cut, like, I was trying to save money. So I got rid of one person, but then ended up. Uh, I, f- I forgot the path I was on, but I ended up hiring them back because they were the cheapest. And they acted like they'd never been there before. They're like, yeah, oh yeah, I'm going to do my best. Like, thanks for hiring me. It's like, okay, no animosity. All right. <laughs> Did they do well the second time around or? It was, it was like, it was like they never left. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was very, it was very milk toast. <laughs> Um, so one of the big elements of this is, yeah, kind of developing four different consoles, which plays into optimizing your resources. Um, every time you release a game, you get to kind of see where your game charted on the, uh, the sales chart that week. And then you watch as your game sells and sales decline week over week. Um, but as you accrue money, you know, that money obviously goes to pay your employee salaries, but you also use it to invest in new projects. Did Either of you have a preferred platform to develop for? Kind of went with the flow um, as much as I could until like the license fee would kill me. Like I would want to pivot right away, but I couldn't. I would need like wait a year until I got the funds. Yeah. Um, but I try. I mean, I used like you said. It kind of goes with history, so you kind of know what becomes popular. Um. Oh, so when I guess you should explain this. When you're picking a console to develop for, you're kind of shown like what percentage of the market they have, and you yeah. want to aim for a higher market percentage, much like real right. life, so that way you get more eyes on the console. Um, so like, but like it kind of follows real life, where like you have like the like the Nintendo. I said in air quotes, and he, it, yeah. you very much see like Sega make their stuff. Uh, but like I would stay away from the crap, like the fake Jaguar and the fake 3DO. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the, and the Virtual Boy. Like I remember, like yeah. it came out and it was like, I don't think this is going to do very <laughs> yeah. well. And it's like, yeah, I probably should invest in that. Um, yeah. So like I, you know, I was trying to stay, you know, somewhat with on, on the popular console. But yeah, no. Sometimes you just had to stick one, stick on one until you made enough money to get a licensing fee. But then sometimes you knew that clock was ticking and you know like, all right, we the yes NES equivalent has been out for a bit. When's that next generation going to come? And you kind of yeah. like wait a little bit, and Steven waited out a little bit longer. Mark, did you stick to anything? Did you kind of jump generation to generation? Um I wanted to jump generation to generation, but I only had enough money for a license, but not to make a game for said system. So everything was a PC game at that point. And let's be real, every game is a PC game at at, at start. There's yeah. Can't make a game without it. So It's true. <laughs> Did sales do well enough on PC, do you think? Eh, for the most part, I think I think only one time I moved to the Exodus. Yeah. And there was some success there, but I couldn't keep that going just because it was too expensive. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, PC was mostly fine. I ended up at some point uh, pivoting to the Game Boy, which what was it? The Game Kid. Okay. Um, and I kind of just stuck with that forever because every time I wanted to upgrade, it was just like, well, I know this next thing's just around the corner, and then, oh, here is that thing, but it's $10,000 to license the thing. Like, it was always way out of reach. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got, I I really just wanted to see if I could get high review scores and high outputs. So 
I was probably incorrectly investing a lot of money into contract help uh, where like instead of using my in-house people because they seem to be terrible at the like those big swings you have to make for like the startup or the graphics or the sound, I would hire those external people, bring them in, which usually the good ones cost a lot of money, but you'd get a pretty high return um, on you know your output. But that would leave me with little to nothing to actually do these licensing fees. So, I uh, I just that scoured. I just scoured through. I was also in the game kid for like twelve titles. Uh, yeah, I I'd have to go back and look at my exact count, but I know I did. You know, in this most recent run, I had over twenty titles, and I would say probably like eighteen were game kid. Um, oh, what was your was guys? Yeah. Oh, I have 32, huh? but it's not even capturing the whole history of my game. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, what was your highest review score? This run, I could not get the 40. Um, I will let you know. I just had to ship a game to get to this menu. So I will let you know the score from that. Uh, it was a 36 out of 40. I think that was the highest I've ever gotten. Oh no, I got wow. a 37. I got a 37. Okay. Oh, I got another 37 somewhere else. What year are you in right now? Uh, year 15. Damn. Okay. Yeah. This time, I know, I remember, you know, the first time playing on an iPhone way back when I got pretty far. I never got a perfect 40, but I remember making the Hall of Fame because when you make it into the Hall of Fame, which is reaching 32 points or higher in the review score, meaning that an average of eight per reviewer, because they do sort of the old uh, EGM or the Famitsu approach of four reviewers rating out of 10, and then they add those totals up. Um, so yeah, if you got 32, then your game reached the Hall of Fame status, and then you'd be able to make direct sequels. Of course, you could always name games what you want and have your own sort of headcanon sequel, but there is a, a proper sequel button or choice uh, if you have a game that has a high enough score. Um, so yeah, I, my highest was 28 this time around. I did not even crack 30. Mark, did you have a high? Are we, are we talking review? Yeah. yeah. Do you know what your highest review score was? Is it higher than number is better, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um... 19 that ain't yeah that's about make it some billy hatch average <laughs> those were like my averages i started to get into the 20s but i just i'd hit a point where like i couldn't i don't know i kind of hit a peak and then i fell back down yeah cut them um, off get rid of the asses hire in that bring in that hollywood weird. agent it's weird because like 19 was my highest but for but that placed in the it was it, it placed 12th but a but a game that had 18 points was made it to the 10th place you mean for sales yeah so mm -hmm. yeah yeah you you get a uh like a first week sales chart thing yeah. i never hit number one the highest i got was a number two oh. Which, matt i'm sure mm -hmm. it sounds like from soft did very well. We uh, once we started pumping out a number. Once we got our first number one game, um, I was running out of names. I was running out of ideas to get the sequel. So I made a um, a life animal game and it called a Life of Black Tiger. Shout out to that PSN Beautiful. game. I um, it was number one on the Game Kid, and ever since then. We were all number ones. All, yeah, every game since that that point is yeah. a number one. Uh, if you give me, if you give me uh, two seconds here, let this first week of this new game I just shipped go on. Uh, I will let you know if it's number <laughs> one. But I'm going to assume that it is because it's a sequel to the much awaited. Yep, number one. Okay, yeah, we uh, number one streak continues since Life of Black nice. Tiger on the Game Kid. Very nice. Uh. Did you did either of you, did either of you receive any fan letters that stood out? Uh, I don't yes. I wish I could see where they were 
or, or I don't know phones. if you can after they're done. I have screenshots of mine just because I thought they were funny. But I, I mean, it, it was more heartwarming than anything. It was um yeah. I made a racing game called a robot racing game called Rev, but Rev mm-hmm. is spelled R E V E like Deja Rev. So it has the little like accents on top of the E's and all that. Um. But somebody wrote in saying that that game was their inspiration to become a race car driver. Look at you. I'm like, all right. Cool. I, in a similar vein, I had someone who wrote in and said, um, this is Hank Wright, age 28. I'm a professional race car driver. This is my first fan letter, so forgive me if it's hard to read. I always use your racing game to practice a new track before actually getting into my car. Yeah. Congratulations. Which... I don't remember any of mine. Sorry. I know I got um, some, gotta... but nothing. I took a screenshot of the first one we received from Bobby Anderson, age 15. <laughs> Hello, I'm a high school student and I love Quando games. In fact, I've been playing them so much I failed my last math test. I'm really looking forward to what you're going to put out in the future, so please work hard on them. By the way, my favorite game is um, 1776 2 The Lost Quill. <laughs> That was just uh, one of my history games I made. I didn't expect to break Matt like that. <laughs> the Lost Quill. <laughs> what a dumb subtitle. The Lost Quill. Oh, my God. I had a pretty pretty good time. <laughs> that game uh, only got a 16, though, from the reviewers. So. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you couldn't make good sequels to that. Uh, yeah, you know. Uh... We do what we can, but I had to. Um, <laughs> I had to. I had to resort to the backlog of FromSoft games real quick after I wasn't getting the sequel as fast as I wanted to. So for the game kit, I made Little Sekiro, Lil like the rapper. <laughs> I like Lil. <laughs> Lil Sekiro is good. Um, uh, Matt, I think you're the only one of us who probably could have. Did you develop a console? Sure did. <laughs> Oh my gosh. What a okay, fucking so, blue or what's your question? <laughs> no, well, to point out to the listener, so as you play through the game, you earn sort of you obviously get more money, you reach more maturity, and you have the ability to upgrade your office. And it's not until you can you you reach year 3 and you or I'm sorry, tier 3 of the yeah. office upgrade uh when you unlock the ability to develop your own console. Of course, you can always make games, but also the game gives you the option to uh choose contract work. So You can choose contract work. It's a way for you to not to develop a game, but just to earn money. Um, But you have to be careful. If you do too much contract work, your fan base will shrink because you haven't put out a game in a long time. So you have to be, you know, diligent about that. But it's it's a good way to make money quickly. Uh, But year or tier three, once you reach that, you have the ability to make a console, not just a game, and then you can start making money off licensing it. So. Matt, what was your console, and what did you call it? What did you did you find it uh, paid off? well for you uh, Ooh, can i can i guess the name yeah sure all right so your company's from soft did you name the console too hard no that was a good name <laughs> that was a good name i i did use the from soft track record but i figured it was more modern history because i know the game will stop probably before like play the playstation 4 so it was very modern era and i named it the elden ring Mm. Yeah, uh, that's, that's solid. It is Blu-ray drive, state of the art, sixty-four bit. All we we put money into this because again, we're a very cutthroat culture to get number ones, and the number ones have to pay off. I will say I forgot how to make a console. I now remember if I had to look it up way back when, but I definitely had to look it up this time because I could not remember what you needed to get the console. Uh, but you need to hire a hardware engineer. And sorry, you have to make a hardware engineer by maxing them out in all um, positions at level five, and then hardware engineer wow. becomes available. Um, I did. I forgot all about that, so I I did cheat a little bit to figure out how to make the console. Um, but yeah, no, I made I made the uh, the Elden Ring, and its debut. Not so much launch title, but I like to think it launched with Armored Core 3. Love that. 
Nice. Uh, yeah, I did not. I didn't get to that. I, I had the point where I could like start to and I had hired somebody expensive. So I was like, maybe I should go that way. But uh, yeah, did not. Alas. Um, I guess it's time. Do, do you guys have your, your game catalogs? You want to run down some of the names of your, your evolution? I probably games? have the shortest. What do you what do you got? What did you uh, what did you put out into the world? I have four IPs. Three of them have sequels. Um my my flagship game was Mystical Mutant. Nice. Okay. Um and then there was a sequel, which did very well. Um I think that was on like the the NES equivalent or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, NES, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, uh, that I hasn't mentioned before. We have the Rev games. Um, I did one historical trivia game on the PC called Trivia Trail. It's good. And then uh, it didn't do the best, but it's the closest to heart. Cold Steel the Hedgehog. Ooh, nice. <laughs> uh. If people don't know, we should probably Google Cold Steel the Hedgehog, because it's a real thing. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I did um, Cold Steel 2. So yeah, the, all of them have twos except for Trivia Trail. That's a solid... I, I kind of want to... Someone should make a game jam out of people's fake game... You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. actually turn these into games. Uh, so I had, uh, golf time, a golf time. Sorry. That was my first game was a golf time. Uh, mm-hmm. then we followed that up with animales, uh, which of course was met soon thereafter by 1776 <laughs> to the lost quill. Wait, you uh, just started with jungle. two. Yeah. <laughs> it's even better. I, I, I look sequels sell better. So I wanted to draw them in, you know? The first uh, one was a tabletop. Had a, <laughs> an animal puzzle game called The Jungler. Uh, <laughs> a, another puzzle. I think this is a puzzle visual not or no, that doesn't add up. I forget. I don't know, it's called Silent Shuffler. Um, I made a pirate adventure game called Ocean of Pirates because I was kind of going for a Sea of Thieves thing there. Gotcha. Uh, then we had Mecha Gun, Micro Monsters, which was my Pokemon ripoff, trying to be Pokemon to market. But the same <laughs> year it came out, it turns out that they had a Pokemon ripoff that made it to market. And yeah. Um, then I unlocked the ability to make a robot game. So I made Gun Damn Son, uh, yes. which that one won Best Music the year it came out. And I'm very proud of that. <laughs> um, Undirt was a pretty highly reviewed game. Uh, my Final Fantasy ripoff, Last Adventure Effort, came out. Didn't do so well, but sold well. Uh, made a car game called Mitsubishi Gaiden. That didn't do so hot. Uh, <laughs> we had another robot action game called Watch Me Fly. And that one did okay with the reviewers, but it did not do it. It's uh, direct sequel, uh, Robobo, did a lot better. Um, still, though... Last Adventure Effort won Best Design that year at the Global Game Awards. Um, one of my highest reviewed games was Guess That Mess, which was a puzzle game. I uh, got a 25 for that. Uh, and that got uh, Best Design uh, that year. Uh, the year after, I got Best Design for Go Into the Hole. Uh, the year after that, Deny 2, uh, colon, Deny Nothing, got Best Design. Uh, end that year, Mulder on a Train got Best Music, which you might be able to tell us watching X-Files while playing a lot of this game. Mulder on the uh, And Express. then finally, my best, highest reviewed game to date got a 28, and that was Back Off New York. Back <laughs> Off colon New York. I don't remember what it was at all. I think it was an action. I don't, couldn't tell you. I love it. Matt, what did what did FromSoft bring the world? 
the earliest one I can see on the Exodus, I just wanted to say we dabbled in sports from time to time. So I'm just going to keep coming sure. back to the sports. So the PGA. Simply PGA. Classic. PGA. Um, and then when we uh, we moved into the game kit, the affirmation, a little Sekiro. Got a hot 22 out of 40, but t- top five sold first week. Um, I On the IES or the PC, I think it was on my first game, maybe a racing robot game called Armored Position. Uh, I ported good. that to uh, the game kit as Armored Position Pocket, another top five selling. Um, I also ported PGA to the Pocket as Pocket PGA. Uh, Mark, you're going to like this one. On the game, kid, I like to think that the peripheral was part of this, but I may steal Battalion Core. Hell yeah. <laughs> a sim RPG robot game on the game, kid. Um, I did a couple, I did a trivia historical, and I named it, obviously, Bible Games, because that is historically <laughs> accurate. Yeah, it's good. I had that. <laughs> then, um... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> And then, yeah, first Hall of Fame game is Life of Black Tiger, an animal life game. Um, so good. And then, uh, yeah, I started hitting some Hall of Fame games from there, Life of Black Tiger 2. Uh, Super Armored Position on the Super IES made the Hall of Fame. Oh. Super Sekiro made the Hall of Fame with Super IES. And then finally, this is where Armored Core begins on the Super Nintendo, or the, sorry, the Super IES. Um get into a uh again go back to golf super golf armor core um super sekiro da, 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 da. oh i made amplitude i made a music cartoon game on the play status oh that's it's, nice just nice. did amplitude um armor position too because i got into the game box a little bit and then yeah, when the Elden Ring comes out I, I start giving some heavy hitters because it's the future of game. So yeah armor core three Sekiro 3, Armored Core Online, an online RPG robot game. Damn. My god. Uh, I made the sequel that we need, Amplitude 2, music cartoon, sure. of course. And then I did a hard pivot, because I started training some people, um, and I unlocked F1 racing. <laughs> so immediately, uh, we make F1 Championship I followed that up with the sequel that everyone was asking for, Armored Core 4. <laughs> and then the last game that I just launched, literally as I opened the app, F1 Rivals. I was expecting to make a series of F1 games leading up to um, probably something called Hamilton for Stappen 22 to relive the epic F1 duel from that year. Of course. But uh, yeah, no, we, we quickly became a robot action team to a simulation racing team uh if i may if if you continue with this path and play this game still after this uh if i can pitch a game for you please uh you should combine your robots in your sports and have armored four f-o-r-e and make it a robot golf game nice Mm, that's good (laughs) i'm due to make a game i can start to make it right now (laughs) yeah no, I gotta let F1 rivals breathe. I have to do some contract work between. Yeah. Yeah, the contract work's key. So, before we rank this, we haven't really talked... Uh, we've talked a lot of specifics about what we did, what we didn't do. Um, did you guys like the game? Yes. Hmm, I... Th- I do like the concept. I just struggle... <laughs> I just struggled the entire time, but I no, think I, I think it's just yeah. me learning it more than anything. But I, I, yeah, I think you definitely have a better time. Like, I have some questions. There was, yeah, I hit a point where this time around, I remember starting it a couple months ago, and I don't remember what my team was, I don't remember what I was doing or whatever. But I know that I kind of set it down, and I was like, well we don't record that episode for a few months. I'll come back to it. And when I came back to it in preparation to get, you know, further and and pick up where I left off, I opened it up and it was just like my company had missed a deadline for some contract and we got dropped and we didn't get the payout we were expecting and all that crap. And I was like, I'm going to start this game from scratch and whatever. So going into it fresh after you kind of know the shortcomings of yourself and of the game, you, you do, you know, you know a bit more. Um, 
I think also having some of that knowledge of like which game types and genres can blend together. Like those things help you get a leg up quickly. Um, I think that's my biggest gripe with the game is you, there is no way to start with not necessarily a Hall of Fame game, but just a good game. Like all your games are like eight or 10 out of 40 and there's like no way yeah. around it and you have to kind of go through that struggle i'm not saying i want like the cheat code to get start launching all the 40s like i appreciate kind of like the build up but if you're trying i don't think this is necessarily trying to mimic real life too too much but like how many just dudes off the street indie like their first like real published game is the one that like blows up and is like the 10 out of 10 um it happens. Yeah, I mean, like, it happens. I mean, granted, I know they they do experience, and, you know, they might publish in other ways, but, um, I don't know, it just, you're, you, no matter how many times you play, you always have to go through that initial struggle, I think, before you can really have fun and, like, spend money yeah. training and getting to new concepts and, yeah. um, you know, making the hardware engineer and getting the console, like, it takes a bit... We were talking about speedrunning last week, but it takes a bit to work up to that point of like where it could be- become a lot more fun, every or like creatively wise. Yeah, like yeah. I feel if this game were updated now, it'd probably be very different on how these games would be made or approached. Like I feel because like I feel like since this game has been made, games have taken quite a shift on how things just get put out there and get picked up and it's somebody's like first game and it's a hit and just for hiring somebody to be like i I get that you need progress in this game and you need to do things to unlock other things but it is a little weird for it to be a simulation and you just can't make whatever you want like you have to unlock more options of combinations when it really it's like no i would have thought of this game probably from the start i didn't need to make five games for getting the ability to have True. ninjas yeah, in yeah, my it, game or something. Yeah, that's one of those things It's just like, <laughs> a, you know, it's a thing to unlock in a video game. Yeah, but I mean, but. It, it's I guess that's very nitpicky of me, if anything, but it, it did seem a little weird. It's been a minute since I played it, but there is that other game dev, I forget the game name. Game dev tycoon? Yeah. Uh, have any of y'all played that before? No, I thought no, I that was the, the one originally... Game we were going to be playing because i always always get always get that name or that icon like that logo is like yeah it's ingrained in my in my head when we yeah no it name. was i so like that one it really i mean obviously it comes out like year you know years later but like i don't know it was like too um i don't know i guess if you were chasing it it was there but like this was the amount of complexity in this was like perfect for handheld like that game kind of ratchets it up the complexity a little bit like there's a i think you do hardware um but then like you're also like researching game engines and knowing when to like kind of go live with a new one with your new game or what like it kind of gets into a little bit more and i like when i know this originally came out on the windows pc in 1997 but like you know on phone i think this is like the perfect like kind of yeah, it's complex, but like it's simple enough where you can pump out a game yeah. in like ten minutes, um, it's, it, like, and then it, put it, it down. It has approachability to it. Yeah, and like that's what I'm trying to say. Like, that one, I, it's approachable. You'll get a damn, but like, that's definitely like sit down at your desktop or you know whatever console right, you're playing right, right, and, right, and yeah. play it. Yeah, this one. It, it just it does feel it, it's definitely marked to your point like dated in terms of like you know yeah a modern version of this like you would see smaller teams like there could be variance in team size and things like that maybe you have to manage running a huge studio versus a small team of two and uh you have different channels to get the game out there but otherwise like approach and gameplay and things i think this is kind of timeless in that regard um like sure. the fact that this was made in 97, but it still feels like a good solid mobile game that was made last year or, you know what I mean? Like, I think it's got that going for it. Oh yeah. Um, I would agree. But there are some things that are frustrating where it's just like, ah, I wish I knew which things worked better or I wish I could 
like build a relationship with one of the console manufacturers and say, hey, we'll only develop for your console for the next five years if you waive the license fee because it's so expensive. Um, you know, some variants and that kind of stuff would have been nice, but still, I'm, I'm, I can't hold that super against it. Um, yeah, any final thoughts before we rank this thing? I, kind of, I think it's like the perfect kind of complexity for mobile uh yeah. having a little bit of experience at that other game on steam um yeah i mean the, yeah the, i know i brought up the the start of the game and how that can be a little challenging it takes a little bit to kind of get going and let you be creative where you can fail a game and not <laughs> have to do contract work for three years to recover um yeah yeah so yeah like uh you know that's it is what it is, but I think at the end of the day, once you kind of get out of the hole and you can start being creative, like that's when it gets real fun, and that's when like you start talking and, like about the dumb titles you made, the dumb things, and like you're not risking your gameplay because you are doing all right. You can afford one bad one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really dig the game's presentation. Like, I like its little simplistic, isometric art style and. The fact that you can customize so much with it, it does give me the vibes of, like, when I would play those, like, old social games like Coke Music or Have a Hotel or something. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of has those vibes to it, and I appreciate that. I, you know, I, I like that it kind of mirrors real life and does its own take with, like, the consoles and the reveals and the events and, you know, it kind of, and, like, it follows all those beats. Um, yeah, it was it was cool to have the option to have those old iMac computers that were in the different colors. Yeah. That so was nice. <laughs> like I had those blue ones, um, in, in my, in, in my studio, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I think for what this is, I, I, I think it works pretty decent. I've got a nomination for where we rank it. Uh, listeners, you can follow along with the list at the free cheese.com slash, the list uh, do you guys have a gut feeling for it yes uh i don't know i i, I don't know i can see this kind of all over the place mark what's three two one it you ready wait are, are, are we saying the number say the number you would put it at after after I count down, you ready? Okay. Or Matt, count us down three, two, one, and then Mark will scream our numbers. Okay. Right. Three, two, one. Forty-five. Thirty-one. Whoa. I heard it's, it's <laughs> tough. It's tough for me to hear both. So I heard thirty-five to thirty-one. Forty-five, thirty-one. I think it's forty-five. Joe said thirty-one. Okay. Yeah. So I put this as the new thirty-one. Mark said the new forty-five. Where do we go from here? I mean, we I, like can, it, we, I, I like it towards the top part of that range. <laughs> well, let's let's climb. We like it over Devil's Crush. Mm. Yeah, because I like it better than some of the stuff of, like going above. All yes, right, we, no, actually, on. no. Yes, no, I like it better than Devil's Crush. Yes, yes. Let's do this. Do we like it better than Psyops? Yes. Mm. Perfect Dark? Yes. I'll just say right now, simulations aren't really my thing. So... Yeah, that's fair. And just, it, I think it's a little... It, so, it, so I, I'm i trying to be more objective about it, but... Um, I think I, I think it just... It, it, ha it, has a, it has a tough time competing with this list. Just for this, for this type of game for me. Yeah, we don't have anything like this on the list, yeah. for sure. So it's just a little tough. It's just, I, I could just see me investing more into these other games. I definitely like it mm. some, more than some of the things in that like 40 to 45 range, though. I do as well. When we get into the thirties, I think like I start to struggle around Snatcher, which is at thirty five. Yeah, I think I like Snatcher better than this. I like Parodius better than this. Parodius has a lot of depth. 
amplitude was really unlike anything else. So I, 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 yeah, I think I'd have a hard time putting this over amplitude. Um, right. Yeah, I, mean, I could see this being up there. I I could put this above Star Fox and be happy with it between amplitude and Star Fox. We could put it above amplitude if you want. I think I like amplitude better. Yeah, I like amplitude better. It, like Parappa started modern rhythm games, but amplitude took it to a new level with you know licensed music and things like that. Do we like it over Star Fox or below Star Fox? I would. I, I like it above, but I'm. I. I think I've been very vocal. I'm not the yeah. biggest fan of Star Fox. Well, you no, know, you. I. I think I. I think I agree with you, man. I, I think like whenever I think about Star Fox, like I. I just I love the IP, so it's just fun to always think about Star Fox. But jumping but, into yeah. that game can be taxing, de- depending on how long you play it for. I uh, like. There's <laughs> like one third of that gr- game is great. The next third is okay. Then there's just a third <laughs> I hate playing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I I guess we technically met halfway with that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we <did>. yeah. <laughs> well, there it is. Game Dev Story, our new number 38. It's a good one. Check it out. It's on your phone. It's on a lot of platforms now. If you haven't played it before, you can go play it. Um, Let us know if we get it running on Steam, because I'm really, yeah. I'm really I'm curious, curious about just this. Try to get it running myself. <laughs> I just, I, I just want to know what the hell Dungeon Village Two is. <laughs> yeah, I want to find out what's happening there. Um, our month of uh, being competitive does not end with game dev story. Uh, next week, we'll try and climb to the top of the beach in Windjammers Two. So stay tuned for that. Come back and hang out with us. Uh, until then. Thanks, Kairosoft, for the video game. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. That's not how I... That's not the order. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, listener, for listening. See you next time. Goodbye.